I am back. Puppies have been fed and they're down for a nap. <laughs> so part two, here we go. Let's now look at how to do some of these examples in Python. So I've got my um, mini kind of loaded up here and I'm going to import NLTK. And this way I'm gonna write my own grammar. Okay? So it's really difficult to write a grammar. So with our recursive de descent parser, what we have to do is basically tell it how we're gonna break those sentences down. So we are writing a little bitty bit of grammar, but I would tell you that in general, just let the system do its thing, right? So let's see here. What we could do is say in LTK, context-free grammar from string, okay? which implies that you are writing out the grammar by hand. We'll say sentences are noun phrases and verb phrases. Verb phrases are verb phrases and noun phrases, or this little pipe means or, a verb, a noun phrase, and a preposition phrase. Preposition phrases can be a preposition and a noun phrase. And then here are all of our possible combinations. A verb are the words that you see above, um, or that we'll, we'll see here in a minute, they're on another slide. Uh, the noun phrases can be a singular noun, a determinant and a noun, or a determinant, a noun, and a preposition phrase. So I don't even have adjective phrases in here. Here are all of my determinants, here are all of my nouns, and here are all of my prepositions. Hopefully you can see right away this is going to be a big pain. Because the first thing we would need to do if we were actually going to write one of these systems is tag everything and include them in the grammar. And so anytime you run into a new word, you're going to have problems. So first problem right away. The uh, training is very easy in LTK dot recursive parser, recursive descent parser, and you just put in the grammar. Okay, there are other ways to train this, but this is just an example. Create a new sentence here, Mary saw a dog. And I print out the tree for that. Now that's hard to read, so instead we can print out the picture which I thought I had on here. But either way, um, what we can see is that it broke down into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. That verb phrase is a verb and a noun phrase, which is a determinant and a noun. So it's a tuple of tuples. It's a like really crazy embedded tuple set. All right, now some problems with recursive descent parsing include left recursive pieces saying something like a noun phrase can actually be a noun phrase and a preposition phrase, but that can cause it to indefinitely loop because you're saying that a noun phrase is a noun phrase. It is quite slow and very inefficient. And it will backtrack if it makes a mistake, but that backtracking system, while beneficial for not getting stuck, can lead you to undo things that were right and redo them the wrong way. And the top-down nature of this is kind of odd because what people do is they listen in parts and they, they parse as they go. But what this system does is it takes the whole sentence and breaks it down. Shouldn't we be using a system that matches people? Not that we're efficient <laughs> in any way. Um, and that system would instead taken chunks as it went and to try to parse a, as you went along. Okay, that's called a bottom-up parser. Okay, the official bottom-up parser that we're gonna talk about is called shift-reduce parsing. Okay, and it considers the input of sentences as we go. And so it tries to find sequences of words that are on the right side of the grammar. Okay, a noun phrase is a noun and a determinant and essentially shift them into the left side which is the, the larger term. So if I find a determinant and a noun, I shift that into a noun phrase until you reach sentence level. So we're working from the bottom up now. Now, if items in the stack, the list of things that you currently see match some right-hand rule, it will shift them and combine them into the left-hand rule and then move on. Okay. It shift replaces until a sentence is reached. But one of the bad things about these is they can get stuck because there is no backing up. Once you have shifted and reduced, that's it. <laughs> you cannot go back and undo that. 
So here's the stack. We got the first words, the. Well, I know that the is a right hand rule for determinant, and that dog is a right hand rule for noun. This determinant noun combination is a right hand rule for noun phrase. And then it keeps going verb, another noun phrase, et cetera. When I see verb and noun phrase together, that shifts into verb phrase, which then combines combined into sentence. So the first one breaks down going from left to right, and the second one breaks down going from uh, right to left. Now it's the same grammar that we put in there because the rules of the sentence structure haven't really changed. However, uh, the function is shift reduce parser. Okay. It does not have any backtracking, so it might fail to find a parse tree. And it will only find one tree, even if there is more than one possible tree. Whereas a, uh, a recursive descent parser will find all of the possible trees. Okay. Now, as noted, they can reach a dead end, even if the sentence is grammatical, which is usually just you not writing the the grammar well enough, and there's sort of inherent limitations of dealing with recursion. Okay. And that happens when the original parse choices were incorrect, but it can't really figure out what to do with what, what is left over. So it ends up with some leftover words and it can't figure out how to shift into sentence. And so shift reduce parsers don't handle recursive sentences very well because they tend to stop after it gets to the sentence marker, even though it might have multiple embedded sentences. And so it gets stuck at this question, what sh reduce should I use if multiple ones are valid? And should I shift or reduce when both are possible? Now we could extend the parsers that we have to deal with the problem. And one of the most popular ones is called the left corner parser. And the left corner parser is meant to be a hybrid system of both the top down and the bottom up approaches. And that does mimic what people do a little bit because in general that we tend to, uh, we do tend to back up when things are confusing. So that's uh, a more accurate of the recursive descent. <sighs> Sorry, them puppies are wearing me out. Um, and, but the shift reduce parser also makes a lot of sense because this is actually how we hear and read. Okay. So the left corner parser is mostly top down because they break less with some bottom up filtering involved. And before starting, it will create a table of all the possible left corners and adds in the, the noun phrase is the left corner and the verb phrase is the left corner. So um, do I have a sentence here? Let's say we want to parse John saw Mary, a very simple sentence. Um, what we would do is find all of the left corners. Well, we can see here that the left corners or the left side here is, um, is either a determinant and a noun, a determinant and noun, a preposition, or a singular noun. So all the left corners in John saw Mary is both John and Mary because they're both um, the left possible options for the left-hand side in the reduction technique. Now, which noun phrase do we start with first in our sentence because um, they're both left corners, right? And so we'd actually reduce both of them first and then find the verb and reduce again. Now, NLTK does not have a good implementation of this, so we're not gonna show it to you, Instead, we're gonna switch gears just a little bit. Now, I hate to break this lecture across two weeks kind of oddly, but otherwise 76 slides is gonna be a lot of a lot of stuff for next week. So we're gonna go ahead and in this week's lecture, talk a little bit about dependency parsing as a contrast and prepare ourselves for the lectures next week. Where we're gonna look at how to implement this in Spacey. So we're gonna cover a little bit of dependency parsing today and save the last 40 slides or so for next week. Okay. So just a reminder that constitu constituency parsing ugh, is a way to make parse trees. The usefulness of parse trees is that they can tell us how complex the sentence is. 
by thinking about the depth of the tree. We can see how many noun phrases there are. We can look at um, how, how, uh, how abstract, how not complex, but um, my brain, oh, my brain, right? How many interpretations there are for the sentence, sorry, ambiguity, because if a, a sentence has more than one parse tree, it is naturally ambiguous. Cool. Now I would say that constituency parsing is like a word nerd thing. This is maybe not used too much in production um, or for really business purposes. However, dependency parsing is used quite a bit. But dependency parsing at its base is constituency parsing transformed. So that's why we started there. And then now we're gonna talk about dependency parsing. I do think dependency grammar is more informative in lots of ways than constituency grammar. But since that's how you get constituent, how you get dependencies is first by doing constituencies, it makes some sense to start talking about them. Okay. So phrase structure grammar, essentially what we've been doing, focuses on how the words combine into this tree structure and their constituents. Okay. Dependency grammar, on the other hand, looks at the relationship of words to other words. All right, I'm not sure how many interruptions one can have in one video, but I'm back. So we were talking about how I think dependency parsing is awesome. And let's move into that now. So phrase structure grammar, which is what we've been working on and talking about across the like four videos that this has become because everybody keeps interrupting my recording session focuses on how we combine words into those constituents or those smaller phrase structures. Dependency parsing, on the other hand, looks at the relationship of words to other words. So now we're getting at their semantic tie between words. So what we'll do is create a head word, which is the, the word that, that is the main word and its relationship to others. Generally, a head word is a verb. We're gonna talk about here about how verbs are special, but a verb has an actor or a noun subject of a sentence. It also sometimes has an actee or a thing being acted upon, a direct object. And so what we'll see is that we're able to trace out from the verb usually how the things are related to each other in the sentence. Where's the modification happening? So this elephant pajamas thing can now be answered better by talking about how the prepositional phrase is modifying the first noun, rather than the fact that it just happens to be in the verb phrase. So usually our head is a verb and every other word is dependent on that verb. Now that is true because verbs usually determine the types of requirements for a sentence. So here's an example picture of a dependency grammar and its graph. And so this is the elephant pajamas one again. Shot here is the head word, so no arrows coming in. Subject or in subject is I, I did the shooting. The object here is an elephant. Elephant has a determinant modifier, AKA the NA kind of word. And then here we've stuck in my pajamas as a modifier on the elephant. So now modifier on elephant, meaning this is the adjective phrase. It's a preposition modifier and a determinant. So this is basically saying the elephants in the pajamas, which is maybe not the interpretation we wanted. Okay. And if we wanted instead, we could take the noun modifier here from I. So I would modify in my pajamas because I am the one in my pajamas. This really helps uh, disambiguate what is happening in the sentence if we agree with the parsing structure. Now you can do this in NLTK, but it is dumb. <laughs> it's like the easiest way to put it. Um, I actually, if you want to do this in R, would recommend you using UDPipe, which I have used for several packages or several projects rather. And it will automatically give you dependency parsing in a couple of languages. It's really great. Um, and we'll do essentially what Spacey will do for us. If I wanted to write this into NLTK, I still have to write the grammar, which is what we saw in the last whatever video it was, <laughs> is tough. It's difficult to, to write these grammars. And essentially you have to, to go ahead and write out the sentence. So why, why, why train the model 
if I have to tell it every single one anyway, right? That's not really a training, that's just telling. So this, this is not a very good system. Uh, it also does not tell you the type of relationship here. It just says that they're connected, right? But the dependency graphs themselves are considered projective if all of the lines drawing can be added without crossing. Okay. It means that all the word and its descendants, which is just kind of fun to say, its dependents are a continuous sequence of words. So here's an example, because that is a little bit abstract. Here's the projective graph. He bought, so this, this line here is not normal. You don't normally see it. So bought, he bought a, a car. So none of the lines cross back over. Okay. Now um, that's because right here, if we decide that because we've uh, we've added the word yesterday in here, I was like, what's, what's going on here? So we've added the word yesterday. Yesterday is a modifier on bot time modifier. And so now I have to cross over where car has its uh, modifying adjective phrase. Okay. And so this one is projective because each line can be added without crossing over another line. And this one is non-projective because it does involve this cross of car and yesterday. Now you can tell it, tell in NLTK, the dependency grammar stuff to make you a pretty tree. And so it does actually give us two interpretations. So when you parse these sentences using our grammar that we wrote, so again, you know, it's kind of a pain, um, we see that there is more than one interpretation, which is true because it, um, the pajamas business is either modifying elephant or I. And so you can make it make these little cute little pictures. I just made this as a real picture, um, but it's essentially I shot the elephant and the elephants in the pajamas or I shot the elephant and I'm in my pajamas, okay? which is the more likely interpretation. This is the more likely parse tree system because of constituency parsing. We'll stick these two together because they're next to each other in the sentence and they're part of the same phrase. Remember the in the pajamas will be considered part of the verb phrase at the end. This one is probably the more accurate semantic representation. And so to me, that's the big thing that we're gonna get out of dependency parsing is a better representation of the semantic relationships in the sentence rather than the just simple syntax relationships in the sentence. You kind of need both though, because if you don't understand the syntax, you cannot write sentences back. If you don't understand the semantics, you definitely can't do anything, right? Because we can just make word salad, but we cannot make uh, sentences that make sense. So what are the rules for understanding what's a head and what's a dependent? Well, heads determine the way that the dependency parsing is completed, meaning which word is like the kind of key word that all the other ones are going to come off of in a sentence. And generally that is focuses on the verb because of the way that syntax works. And we'll see some examples here in a minute. So heads determine the semantic class of a sentence. So it does subject verb agreement, um, uh, conjugation of the verb, right? Past tense, present tense, that kind of stuff. So these are no longer context free because it does depend on the type of verb or other object in the sentence. Okay. Now having a head in a, in a sentence is required. And so verbs are required. Uh, dependents are actually optional or sometimes implied. So if we said, please pass the salt, the you, the noun phrase part of that is implied. And the morphological form of the dependents are determined by the head. This is a fancy phrase for conjugation. So if you have walks, it is probably he or she because no one else walks. <laughs> and I walk, you walk, they walk. But if it's walks with an S, it's probably a third person present tense. So for example, let's talk about prepositional phrases that include a preposition and a noun phrase. If the preposition is the head of that type of phrase, then the noun phrase is a dependent of the preposition. Okay? 
And that makes it similar to what we did with constituency parsing. It's just very explicit in how the dependents are related. So they're an adject mod adjective modifier or prepositional modifier. Now, I will spend about six slides here telling you how verbs are very special. <laughs> so verbs are unique in terms of sentence processing because they have, they essentially determine what can and cannot happen in the sentence. For example, a verb phrase could be a verb and an adjective, like was, was pretty, was green, was whatever adjective you wanna use. A verb could verb phrase could be a verb and a noun phrase. I saw, okay, so I saw the mailman. It could be a sentence, a verb and a sentence. So I thought I would get through this recording <laughs> faster than I currently am. <laughs> right? It could be a verb, a noun phrase, and a prepositional phrase, like the verb put. So I put the phone on silent. Right, and so some sentence examples, the Sarah squirrel was frightened, chatterer saw the bear. I just laugh every time. These are from the NLTK book. <laughs> chatterer thought Buster was angry and Joe put the fish on the lock. So what we have are four simple sentences that have four different constituency parsing rules, which then translates to four different types of dependencies. So, Things like was can have an adjective after it, but things like saw tend to have a whole noun phrase, whereas things like thought have an entire sentence after them. Okay. Put likely has another noun phrase and a prepositional phrase after it because put is a, a word that has a direct object required. So that seems like a lot of different combinations, but there's actually pretty set rules based on the type of verb it is on what complement or um, goes with it. So complement here, not with the I, not, you know, you're really great. This is complement meaning required word that goes with it. And we've kind of been calling these grammatical slots, meaning if you have this type of verb, it has to have a corresponding this type of action after it. Because if you mess that up, <laughs> it don't make any sense. So the squirrel was Buster was angry. So this would be a verb and a sentence, which is a valid syntactic combination, but is not valid for the word was, right? Uh, verb adjective is a valid combination, but not for that verb. Uh, thought the bear. So this would be verb noun phrase, perfectly valid, not for this verb and so on. Okay. So that's the big problem with context-free grammars and constituency parsing is they don't capture the fact that these verbs have special rules. It only captures the fact that the verb noun phrase or the verb combination options are this, right? So we could in constituency parsing, break all these down, and it would argue that those weird sentences that I just showed you were fine because they do match a set of syntactical rules in English. However, in dependency parsing, we would go, do what now? So dependency parsing sort of forces somewhat of a context on it. I think it'll still run. It just <laughs> won't make any sense. Um, where, uh, excuse me, where, if you train a model appropriately, will break down because those are not the proper combinations of words. Okay. So verbs in this case are, are special because they have different valencies. Now, I don't really love this word because I think of valence and I think sentiment analysis, but essentially they have different complements. And so we need to find a way to actually code this so that each verb and its verb phrase gets matched with the appropriate constituent. And so essentially what you do is instead make it a not context-free grammar. It requires context where it's essentially not one verb, it's verb type plus noun phrase, verb type plus sentence. And so you're dis distinguishing between uh, the different verb types in your grammar 
and you're tagging those those verbs as special. And for example, transitive verbs are ones that require a direct object, which would be a noun phrase. So it no longer becomes a verb phrase is a verb plus a noun phrase. It becomes a verb place, phrase is a transitive verb plus a noun phrase. So you're making the distinction between the types of verbs that you're giving it. Okay. So some examples of the different types of verbs. An intransitive verb does not require anything else. Okay. It can include prepositional phrases. The dog barked at nothing this morning, literally nothing, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't have to have anything else. Transitive verbs require a direct object. So saw plus noun phrase, right? Dative or ditransitive verbs require both a direct object and an indirect object. And then from there, we um, have verbs that are allowed to be combined with sentences. So it's called cententi, cententi. It looks like centennial, but it's not. Uh, essentially sentence verbs. So words that are, are verb plus sentence. Then on top of that, add all of the conjugation and uh, subject verb agreement on the numerical quality <laughs> quantity aspects. And you could see that what was a fairly simple-ish system for context-free grammar becomes quite complex because you have to account for all these different types of verbs. And so these are um, indicated by dif the different modifier phrases, right? So prepositional phrases generally are gonna modify nouns, maybe a verb, adjective phrases definitely modifying a noun, adverbs modifying verbs. So we're starting to see why these systems are difficult to write. Okay. So unlike complements, modifiers are optional. And here's the, tr the trick, the fun part, there can be a lot of them. <laughs> so modifier phrases, um, especially in very flowery sentences that have a lot of now adjectives and adverbs can, can, can be quite complex. There's a lot of them that could be happening. So take for example, the word really, okay? much like the word literally, you can put it really almost anywhere in a sentence and it's still grammatically correct. <laughs> and so you can say the squirrel really was frightened. Chatterer really saw the bear. He really thought Buster was angry and he really put the fish on the hook. <laughs> so there are these certain types of modifiers that can kind of be stuck almost anywhere and still be grammatically correct. And we do tend to use them quite a bit. Okay. So this is where we'll stop for this week. Next week, we will talk about how to write your own dependency parser in Spacey and how to just run the basic dependency parser in Spacey. And we'll kind of look at, again, like why is Spacey so difficult? But why is the training data set up so complex? Um, but we'll get into um, how you could write your own system for this type of parsing to find certain types of objects. At the end here, I'll have an example of how someone might use this for a search engine tool that kind of summarizes information for users.